I'm Andrew Krauss, and I'd like to tell you a little bit about my research. So in the description of this video are links to further videos and, and demonstrations of a lot of the ideas that I'll present in this talk. So the sorts of things that I've been thinking about over the past few years are how natural patterns arise, and sort of the causal mechanisms underlying their formation. And there are many different theories and many different phenomena that people study here, so I'll mostly focus on how periodic patterns arise in, in developmental biology, so in embryology. A lot of this motivation comes from experimental work with, with some excellent collaborators looking at different biological systems that exhibit this sort of periodic patterning structure. So the first example is, is mouse whiskers, which are sort of fairly obviously periodic in the sense that you have repeated rows of whiskers uh, forming in development, and these will develop into follicles which eventually become where the root of each whisker is. Now while this is sort of very clearly a periodic structure, it also has an additional macroscopic structure where the rows are organized in this sort of nice way, and there's a size and wavelength modulation across the row. So there are several levels of, of structure inside of these patterns. Our collaborators have done a tremendous amount of work characterizing the biochemistry underlying what, what causes this follicle formation, and it's quite a complicated thing in the sense that the mouse's nose is growing outwards apically during this development, and as this is happening, these sort of periodic patterns are laid down. So other examples of this kind of periodic patterning with additional structure are on the surface of pollen where you have exine forming in, in these, again, kind of complicated structures with some sort of underlying periodicity, and then also in bat teeth where you have quite a, a complicated collection of different kinds of dentition across species, and there are different hypotheses how much of this is due to differential growth between species, how much of this is due to, say, heterogeneous signaling. So I'll next describe one hypothesis for these sorts of patterns in biology. This goes back to Alan Turing almost 70 years ago, and he thought that one way of explaining the sorts of emergent structures that we see in biology is by considering a simple system of chemical species which are reacting and diffusing, and this will, it turns out, naturally lead into sort of periodic pattern formation. To give you an idea of how this works, if we think of two chemical species, U and V, reacting with each other, then we can write down rates of change for the concentrations of these under certain assumptions, so you get a system of two ordinary differential equations. And this kind of spatially homogeneous structure, where I just think of tracking the concentrations, is quite ubiquitous in things like systems biology and in ecology, and this is sort of the standard uh, undergraduate fair in mathematical biology analyzing these systems and their dynamics. But really we're interested in spatial structure, and so a simple way of extending the above system to consider spatial structure is to allow the chemical species to diffuse. So these extra two terms that I've now added, these second derivatives in space, represent random molecular motion or Brownian motion of these two chemical species in some interval between zero and L. And then for simplicity I'll say we'll use Neumann or no flux boundary conditions, but that, that's fairly easy to modify. So the key question is what is the difference in the dynamics between these two systems? Does adding the spatial derivatives matter? Does it change the sorts of behavior that you get? And one way of studying this is to look at an equilibrium point which is consistent between both models, so a spatially constant, temporally constant state where f and g are both zero, so the system doesn't change in time. To analyze such an equilibrium, we can do a linear instability analysis. So we perturb this equilibrium with some perturbation, epsilon uv. We substitute this into the equations. We cancel the higher order terms, and we're left with the following linear system of PDEs. If we neglect the spatial component, and we just consider this matrix here, the Jacobian, then its eigenvalues completely determine the behavior of the spatially homogeneous system. So if all of the eigenvalues have negative real part, then the perturbation always decays, and if any of them have positive real part, then the perturbation grows in time. And so instability occurs when one eigenvalue cr crosses uh, the imaginary axis in this way. The same is true of the partial differential equations here, although the analysis is slightly more complicated. So in the, in the ordinary differential equations case, where I just have two coupled first-order equations, I only have two eigenvalues, whereas in the partial differential equation case, I need to use something like Fourier series in order to analyze this instability. So I won't go into the sort of theoretical details, but you can justify an ansatz of this form 
So these perturbations now grow or decay exponentially in time, depending on the real part of lambda k, and they're modulated in space by these cosines, which are eigenfunctions of the Laplacian. So from this, you can then say, if the spatially homogeneous system is stable, can you find an instability of one of these eigenfunctions? Can you find parameters, for instance, which allow one of these spatial modes to grow in time, but the spatially homogeneous system to remain stable? And this is what we refer to as a Turing instability. From this analysis, you can learn various facts. So for instance, in order for this to happen, you need to have differential diffusion. And this is all quite uh, textbook analysis, which again, most of which was done by Turing himself and then, and then subsequently by others. So I'll now talk about a more abstract generalization where we aren't thinking just of diffusion, but we can think of a more general transport operator acting on a more general spatial domain. So either a subset of Rn or perhaps on the surface of a manifold. In this case, we have the same broad structure of a reaction transport system as written here. Again, an important fact is we need the spectrum. We need a, a point spectrum of this elliptic operator. So we, we search for the eigenfunctions and the eigenvalues. We again do a linear instability analysis where we take this onset, so again exponential in time, modulated by the spatial eigenfunction, and then we get a dispersion relation relating the growth rates of these eigenfunctions to the eigenvalues of the spatial operator. Again, this will be a polynomial in lambda, just as in the, the classical case, though it can have a much richer behavior. But broadly speaking, this is the same as what Turing did in his original paper. So we've applied this kind of philosophy, this sort of approach, to several different problems. For instance, we've looked at pattern formation on spheres with advection. We've looked at the interaction of Turing instabilities and Hopf instabilities leading to spatiotemporal phenomenon on manifolds. We've considered complicated forms of advection. So here we can think of chemicals being advected by a Stokes flow, a low Reynolds number flow, the sort of uh, classical parabolic um, velocity profile in the example of a channel. You can also look at much more complicated spatial domains. So here we have, we have sort of square channels and, and normal pipes and then curved channels. So in each of these cases, the Stokes flow leads to sort of a spatiotemporal modulation of what would be stationary patterns coming from a normal Turing instability. And there are some nice videos of this in the description below. So next I'll talk about a quite different case where this, this sort of classical instability analysis doesn't work, and this is the case of spatial heterogeneity. So Turing himself kind of knew this in, in writing his original paper, that it was an idealization to consider a spatially homogeneous equilibrium which spontaneously underwent a symmetry breaking to spatial heterogeneity, really most pattern formation is from one kind of pattern state into another. So a simple way of representing this is to think that on a, a slower time scale, I have some pre-pattern which has already established itself, and I can think of this by including heterogeneity in, say, the kinetics of my operator. And then I can say, well, what happens next? What is the next part of the evolution? So this also allows you to connect this sort of reaction diffusion patterning with other theories of pattern formation, such as positional information, and it allows you to think about how pattern formation can be modulated by other kind of complicated pieces by breaking them in, into distinct chunks happening at different time or spatial scales. So an application of this, what really motivated my interest in this topic is working with experimentalists on mouse whiskers and again seeing this sort of macro structure that seems very clearly indicative of spatial modulation. So again, we've identified several chemicals which actually do this. There's a, a source of retinoic acid produced at the eye of the mouse, which seems to modulate the patterning. There's also a source of bone morphogenetic protein coming from the nose, and both of these are modulated in both space and time and lead to differences in the patterning across the field, which we've explored in our work. At a theoretical level, we've made some progress in understanding this kind of spatial heterogeneity. So in the case where I put an epsilon squared here in front of the diffusion, we're thinking of patterns which occur at different length scales. So we think of our, our patterns as being rapid relative to the scale of the, the pre-pattern. So our pre-pattern is sufficiently slowly varying. And in this case, you can go through the sort of classical Turing analysis in a local way. And so this red line says that to the left of this red line, I don't really expect a difference from my heterogeneous equilibrium. I expect the system to relax back to the equilibrium, which it broadly does. And to the right of the red line in, in this picture, we expect a pattern to form, which is again what we observe here. 
we can also apply this in interesting ways. We can take a complicated heterogeneous field, so for instance we can take an image, and then we can use the intensity of a pixel at each of these images as inputs to a reaction diffusion simulation. And what you get are um, modulated patterns. So in, in, say, this case on the right with Jim Murray's face, you have regions of spots and then regions of stripes and then regions where the reaction diffusion system is now sitting on the heterogeneous state, the complex spatial heterogeneity. So the previous kinds of examples were somewhat intuitive and they, they made sense thinking of a local picture and so they were sort of an obvious extension of spatially homogeneous analysis. Other things we've, we've found are that this isn't always the case. So even small spatial heterogeneity can induce nonlinear effects that are not captured by the linear theory where, say, a spot or spike solution can be destabilized into an oscillation. Um, and this suggests potentially some obstructions to using this theory or some things that, that we really need to think about when we apply, say, heterogeneity to applications in developmental biology. So the last thing I'll mention are sort of some big picture questions that come out of all of this. So the analysis that I've, I've mentioned above, some of these sort of uh, small progress that I've made, gives you a bit of more hope that this theory might be applicable in real biological settings. But there are quite a few things that are still assumed. There are quite a few things that are still idealizations in, this, in, in what I've done. So for example, even in the very well understood morphogen signaling kinetics, we don't have good pictures of what the real nonlinearities are, particularly when we think of two species systems. Another aspect of this which is still an open problem is that Turing systems don't seem to be robust in the sense that usually it's a small region in parameter space where we observe these instabilities. But biologically speaking, you can do many chemical perturbations to an embryo and still get pattern formation. And so there's a tension between our sort of simple models and real experiments. And then of course the complexity is enormous. Most of the work here, most of the work that a lot of people do are two or three species systems whereas most real biological development occurs with many, many more chemical species. And we don't have a good way of tackling this because it isn't sort of sensible to think of, say, 10,000 nonlinear partial differential equations. We can't really systematically analyze these sorts of things. There are other aspects of this, which I've looked at, and many other people have looked at, applying these ideas in spatial ecology or to organizing human behavior. And again, there are open questions here of, should, is, is the reaction diffusion framework the best one to use? Does it give us any real insight? And then finally, there are lots of mathematical questions, which are quite interesting. A lot of these center around the importance of nonlinearity and when our sort of linear local analysis is valid or when we really need tools and things to give a global perspective on the kinds of behavior we expect. This is especially relevant when we think of patterning on multiple time scales or when we think of structural stability. So in particular, we don't really expect patterning from homogeneous states, so what are appropriate initial conditions and can those matter? Um, I think what I'd like to do is end on this quote by Richard Levin, so I'd recommend pausing the video and reading this. The main thing I want to get across to you here is that there are many different perspectives on approaching these problems. So in particular, there are people who are much more applied than I am, who are much closer to the experimental side. So they will often look at inference and they will often look at parameter sensitivity and trying to fit particular models, both phenomenological and those based on first principles. And then there are people on the much more theoretical side who struggle more with the mathematical questions that I've sort of hinted at and suggested here. So beyond just existence and regularity, there are many people who look at nonlinear structures in these reaction diffusion systems. So I tend to be somewhat in the middle, and my hope is to learn from both sides, to learn from the very heavy applied biological side at the sort of real questions that matter in biology, but also to learn from people who are more mathematically uh, inclined than myself, particularly because they can develop tools that we might use to really solve these problems. So thank you for listening, and please feel free to send me any emails or questions you have.